crisis coming. It was more difficult to see the contagion that spread to the, to the other countries in the region beforehand. Um, instead, I think financial and corporate sector weaknesses, which were not fully apparent, although to some extent apparent at the time, were at the root of the crisis. I think other key ingredients uh, were pegged exchange rates that encouraged, encouraged excessive unhedged foreign borrowing by banks and corporates, uh, inadequate reserve levels, and a, a lack of transparency, I think, not least uh, about the true level of usable reserves at the time. Indeed, from my own experience in, 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 in the Asia crisis, in Indonesia in, in 98, but also in Korea dealing with the debt issues at the turn of 97-98, uh, lack of information really was a, a major impediment both to understanding exactly what was happening, but also to formulating uh, appropriate policy responses, and I'll, I'll come back to that. I think this, this mixture set the, the stage for the sudden reversal of investor sentiment and international capital that, that took place, and undoubtedly uh, greatly exacerbated its effects on those economies. You know, doubts about the soundness of financial institutions and corporates spread very quickly across national borders, and this set off a vicious circle of capital outflows, plummeting exchange rates, uh, and crippling balance sheet effects. Um, Private demand, as we know, collapsed and output in the most affected countries declined sharply. Uh, and as I think was discussed this morning too, the underdevelopment of social safety nets exacerbated the social uh, uh, and economic impact of those slumps. As for the IMF's role, as, as, as private creditors were stampeding for the exits, the international community working through the fund provided substantial financing. We were really the only ones who came through uh, in, in that period. At the same time, governments in the region adjusted policies, I think increasingly taking strong uh, and appropriate actions. Um, and I think there I would, I would agree very much with the discussion this morning about the importance of political circumstances. I think it was those countries that had strong governments in place uh, in a couple of cases, uh, new governments were established fairly early on uh, that, that were best able to implement strong policies and, and, and in fact, fared best with, uh, in coping with the crisis. Um, also, steps, important steps were taken to involve the private sector in providing financing. And this, I think, was something that received, didn't receive enough, perhaps enough attention this morning. For example, in Korea, the debt restructuring that took place in the first quarter, to the, about the end of the first quarter of 1998, and the debt rollover that we coordinated that preceded it were absolutely critical in stabilizing the situation and setting the scene for the recovery that took place later later on. Similarly in Thailand and Indonesia, it was only when private sector involvement in the debt, uh, in dealing with the debt problems uh, got underway that things uh, really started to turn the corner. Um, after some initial adjustments, the, the, this broad approach eventually turned the tide and confidence has began to recover and capital to return, though obviously not before very substantial damage was, was done. As we heard this morning, output did recover quite quickly. We had this sort of V-shaped v recession, and you can see that clearly from the, from the chart there. Um, and it was, it was perhaps the most determined reformers, and I would include their um, Korea and uh, Malaysia that probably recovered the best, although those were the ones too that also had the shallowest uh, hit at, at the beginning from the crisis. Um, let me briefly turn to a couple of the issues that, that came up this morning before moving on to the, what I really want to talk about. I mean, I, I think, um, first of all, uh, I don't really agree that the evidence uh, supports that the IMF got it completely wrong. I think that's just not a uh, a fair reading or an accurate reading either of what happened or what's been written about it. And I'd, I'd refer you, for example, to our own Independent Evaluation Office review uh, of this, which I think, uh, and other reviews, which reach much more balanced conclusions. Let me just turn, talk about briefly a couple of policy areas before moving on. One was fiscal policy. I really don't think that was a factor, quite frankly, in the evolution of the, of the, the crisis. It's true that at the beginning... Uh, the first fund programs targeted a very modest 
uh, tightening of fiscal policy, basically to make room for the costs of fiscal adjustment. But as soon as it became clear that output was declining, <laughs> and likely to decline significantly. Those fiscal policies are reversed. The, the subsequent programs allowed for very substantial increases in fiscal deficits. In the case of Indonesia, the May program had a deficit of 4% of GDP. The uh, July program, 8.5% of GDP. That was to make room for, for, for substantial increases in subsidies, particularly to protect the poor from the, from the effects of the crisis. Although I'd agree with earlier speakers today, who, who argued that it's very hard to put in place adequate social safety nets quickly. And so it proved that in Indonesia, the deficits in the end were much smaller than that for that reason. Just briefly, secondly, on monetary tightening. Um, the alternative to monetary tightening was just to let exchange rates go into a free fall. And quite frankly, it was, it was exchange rate depreciations that did as much damage as anything to corporate soundness. So it would, it would not have been wise to let that happen without trying to resi resist it through, through, through tightening monetary policy. I would say, if anything, a problem was that monetary policy wasn't tightened enough in some of the crisis countries, not that it was tightened too much. And indeed, if you look at Indonesia, the case with which I'm most familiar, it was only in the, sum, in the sort of mid-1998 when interest rates were allowed to rise up to hold, hold the line on money and credit growth that the situation actually stabilized. The exchange rate stabilized, inflation came down, and it was all because Bank Indonesia was willing to see interest rates go up as far as was necessary to hold the line on money and credit growth. Uh, earlier real interest rates had been substantially negative for, for, for uh, much of the crisis, crisis period. Um, let, let, me, let me move on now to the lessons from the, the, the crisis uh, and those that relate to financial liberalisation. Let me first mention one wrong lesson that might have been drawn that wasn't, namely that it would have been best for Asia to withdraw from globalisation, including its financial aspects. I think decide, despite the crisis, Asia has basically continued to embrace globalisation, and today, for that reason, I think, pays, plays an even bigger role in the world economy than it did in the 1990s. Indeed, instead, the reforms that Asia has undertaken... Uh, over the past decade, decade have been geared to equip it to cope better uh, and to benefit, benefit more from globalisation and to cope with its attendant risks, especially those related to mobile capital. I think in that connection, an important lesson that we have learned uh, and, and, and countries around the world have learned, uh, supported by work that we and others have done, is, is that to, to reap the potential gains from financial globalisation, uh, and they are, they are significant, and also to avoid the attendant risks of higher volatility that can go with it, macroeconomic frameworks and financial sectors have to be robust. This means that countries need to meet certain standards of institutional quality, governance and transparency, preconditions that I think, uh, in retrospect, were clearly not met in Asia prior to the crisis. We've also learned a lot more about the interlinkages between the balance sheets of different sectors of the economy, households, government, financial sector, corporates, and about how disturbances can quickly transmit from one sector to, the another, to another, particularly in the presence of external shocks. And this, I think, has helped us and countries, including in the region, to identify weaknesses in those areas better uh, and vulnerabilities, uh, that, uh, and to identify vulnerabilities that might otherwise have uh, gone undetected. I think countries in, in the region have, have, have made considerable progress in, uh, in applying these lessons um, over the last decade. Uh, in particular, they've strengthened their institutional policy frameworks to an impressive extent, I would say, reducing vulnerabilities, although there's a lot, a lot left to be done. Let me first mention three areas where progress has been made. First of all, as we heard this morning, substantial reserve cushions have been built up, uh, uh, and, and that provides a, a, a good cushion against external shocks, although, as we heard too, these, these can become excessive, they can become costly, uh, they can lead to unbalanced growth, uh, and possibly un eventually unsustainable growth. Um, that is one that relies too much on net exports and not enough on domestic demand, particularly uh, investment uh, in, in some cases, to keep growth going. Um, 
A further area where strengthening has taken place is that a number of countries have adopted more flexible exchange rate systems. I think this has allowed for much more effective absorption of external shocks, including shifts in investor sentiment, and we've seen this working well uh, over the last two or three years in a number of countries. Indonesia, for example, went through a bad patch in 2005. The exchange rate depreciated, helped absorb it. Exchange rates still since come back quite strongly. The Philippines also has been, went through a couple of bad patches before more recently very substantially strengthening its fiscal and overall economic position and the exchange rate there took up some of the strain and helped it cope with, cope with those pressures. The Philippines is now much more, much more strongly placed uh, th than before. Um, flexible exchange rates also allow interest rates to be set more in response to domestic conditions so they give you a greater degree of uh, policy independence and they also help to avoid the sort of under-assessment of, of risks of external borrowing that got, got the region into trouble uh, before. I'd say the move to exchange rate flexibility, however, has not been uniform uh, across the region. Some, some countries have gone further than others. I'd note that Korea recently has been uh, running a pretty flexible exchange rate system and its rate has appreciated substantially. Indonesia has been in both directions, as has Thailand. I would say that... Um, China in, in China in particular, though, so far flexibility has been limited and that, that makes it somewhat more difficult for other countries to allow their exchange rates to strengthen and this has been reflected in continued reserve build-ups uh, in significant reserve build-ups in some cases. Um, a, a second area where considerable progress has been made is transparency, uh, which, as I mentioned before, I think is very important. The transparency of policies and available information have improved markedly in recent years. Uh, Asian countries, with, with our help in particular, under various transparency initiatives, now routinely publish much more and high-frequency information, including about their debt and reserve levels. And, of course, with the central banks shifting to inflation targeting frameworks in several cases, there's a lot more information and in routine publications about monetary developments and policies. Lastly, uh, and this is also very important, I think in order to... Um, a number of steps have been taken to uh, reform financial sectors and improve corporate governance. Uh, I won't go into details, overhauling regulatory and supervisory systems and so forth, but you can see the fruits of that success. If you look at the non-performing loans in selected countries, you can see that these have come down very dramatically since uh, 1998 uh, in all the, the foremost affected countries. And if you look at corporate sector too, this is just one indicator, you can see that debt equity ratios have also come down very dramatically to, to fairly normal and, 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 and reasonable levels in, in, in all those countries. The lessons from the crisis have also been reflected as in a number of regional initiatives which I think have been quite important. You see a lot more information exchange and policy dialogue within the region now, including in groupings like ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3, EMEAP and so on, where I think the crisis creating a stronger sense of regional identity and, and facilitating these sorts of exchanges. As we heard this morning, under the ASEAN Plus 3 framework, uh, the Chiang Mai initiative was set up. This was a, a system of bilateral swaps between central banks, uh, and we... Uh, and earlier this month, uh, it was announced that, uh, that the ASEAN Plus 3 is going to try and turn this into a reserve pooling arrangement so that the disbursement of the funds can be better coordinated in the event uh, that they're needed. And I should say that the IMF very much supports these initiatives, and, and we, don't, we see them as complementary uh, to our own financing and, and to our own su surveillance. And, and uh, we maintain a close dialogue with, with ASEAN Plus 3 on a range of matters. Lastly, uh, there have been a lot of initiatives to, to strengthen regional financial integration, uh, particularly as relates to uh, bond markets, steps to broaden and deepen regional capital markets, including through things like the, Asian, the two Asian bond funds and the Asian Bond Market Initiative. And I think these government initiatives are helping facilitate uh, a bottom-up process of financial integration within the region, but also... Uh, with the global economy as well. So I think as a result of all these changes, uh, the strength and resilience of Asian financial sectors have, have been enhanced, 
and the region is much better equipped to benefit from and to cope with uh, financial globalization. Um, and I think we saw this both uh, earlier this year and in, in May of last year. The region's financial markets cope very well with two admittedly quite modest bouts of global financial turbulence recovering quickly. Of course, they remain to be tested by uh, more serious disturbances in global financial markets. I just wanted to say a little bit about some of the continuing challenges that, that are being faced by, by Asia, not just Asian countries, uh, from capital flows. Um, reflecting uh, its, both its integration into global financial markets and also regional ones. And one issue that um, countries have been wrestling with is coping with surges and in inflows this time, not so much outflows, but inflows. Um, you can see from the chart that in, over the last few years, net capital inflows for, for Asia as a whole have been fairly constant at around 2% of GDP. But both gross inflows and outflows have, in fact, increased quite quite. Uh, quite sharply, and um, I think the increase in, outf in, in outflows is particularly noteworthy. I think it reflects a growing desire on the part of Asian residents to diversify their portfolios, and this is a natural part and healthy part of, of financial integration into the global economy. But as well as increasing in scale, uh, there's also been some increase in volatility, uh, and this chart shows the volatility of uh, capital inflows to the region and you can see there have been some episodes where these have included uh, these have exceeded two standard deviations from their normal uh, behavior and uh, this gives rise to concerns in particular that that surges in inflows can create problems uh, putting up put pressure on currencies at times strongly uh, can provide additional sometimes unwarranted unwanted loanable funds to the financial sector and also potentially cause asset price bubbles and perhaps also create a risk that these funds will flow out very suddenly uh, faster than they come in. I think a temptation here may be to try to address these concerns by imposing some form of capital controls to discourage uh, the speculative inflows. And while this can't, while I, I wouldn't rule this out entirely, I think it can be very difficult to do in practice, particularly in these circumstances. And indeed, it can often be counterproductive. I think, as we saw in, in, in Thailand last year, as it, in fact, as it actually turns out, what was thought to be a surge in capital inflows in the last quarter in Thailand was actually a surge in the current account surplus and not uh, a surge in inflows particularly after all. And I think there's evidence to suggest that capital controls tend to be particularly easily circumvented when they're, when they're reimposed in, in, in a system that had been previously quite, quite liberal. I think also in those cases there can be circumstances, uh, that controls can create <laughs> doubts about the f future course of policy uh, and potentially discourage foreign direct investment, which is something to keep in mind. Um, I would say that for the time being, surges in inflows are a, 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 are a feature of the global financial landscape and something that I think countries probably have to, have to live with. Uh, there's no magic bullet for dealing with them. I think the best short-run response is to allow a combination of exchange rate flexibility with perhaps some limited intervention to smooth out uh, exchange rate movements. I think over the longer term, and countries in the region are doing this, steps to develop uh, and deepen financial markets, including uh, in the context of the regional financial integration, integration initiatives I mentioned, can also help. Um, and lastly, I think further liberalization on restrictions on outflows, albeit cautiously and as warranted by the pace of financial market uh, reform and, and strengthening, can also support deeper integration and potentially help offset uh, and cope with swings in capital inflows. Let me finally turn to, uh, I missed that slide out, but anyway, let me finally turn to um, what we've been doing at the fund to respond to the, to the Asia crisis, uh, just touching on a, a, a few areas. I mean, first of all, we've very substantially uh, increased our work on financial sectors uh, and, in, and integrated this much more closely with our more traditional macroeconomic analysis. Focus here is, is on identifying potential vulnerabilities in the final financial sector and appropriate um, policy responses. This is now a, a central part of our, 
our dialogue with member countries, including in the context of Article 4 consultations, but also with our financial sector assessment program, which a number of countries in the region have participated. Am I running on too long? Um, you've got about six minutes. Okay. Um, well, I'm nearly finished. So. Um, We've also done a lot of work, as I mentioned before, over the last decade to understand better how vulnerabilities in the, in the financial sector can be transmitted to other sectors of the economy and, and vice versa. And we've been continuously adapting our analysis and approach to these issues in light of this uh, ongoing research effort. We also monitor now global developments in global and regional capital markets much more closely than before. Uh, and we analyze their potential implications for economic and, and financial stability very closely and, and have a dialogue with member countries and regional groupings uh, about these sorts of interactions. Um, second, we do, we do more analysis at the multilateral and regional levels to complement our, our country level work. The goal here is to, to capture common trends uh, and, and, and capture actual and potential spillovers, especially from financial market developments. Uh, better than we better than we used to, I'd I'd refer you to our uh, the Asian Department's Regional Economic Outlook, uh, which is published uh, every six months. The last one came out usually around the time of our spring and annual annual meetings, um, and the one in September had some. There was a discussion this morning about um, inequality and poverty. The one in September, I think, had some quite interesting material. Uh, in it on, I digress here, but on uh, developments in inequality in the region. Uh, and it showed, in fact, that uh, they have been rising steadily, that this predates the Asia crisis, that the Asia crisis was, in fact, uh, more of a, a hiccup in that trend rather than something that permanently altered it. Uh, altered it. And, and we discussed some of the possible uh, reasons for, 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 for what's been, uh, what's been going, on, going on there. Um, thirdly, we're, we're, we're also assessing uh, whether we have the, the right tools for crisis, the right financing tools for crisis prevention, and whether we can't agree within the membership on a new liquidity instrument that would provide ex ante substantial uh, liquidity to, for countries that, that have strong frameworks but remain vulnerable to external shocks. But we want, we want it to be one that is both uh, useful to and would actually be used by uh, emerging market countries. This is a successor to our contingent credit, credit line, which in the end was not uh, used by any countries, so we don't want to fall into that same trap again. Uh, fourth, and this came up this morning too, we've learned a lot more about the importance of country ownership of programs. Uh, programs have to be ones that are developed by countries, and we give, in program design, it has to be the country's own priorities that are reflected uh, in the structure of pro programs. And we've also learnt the importance of streamlining conditionality in programs so that they cover only those elements of programs that are actually critical to, to maintaining macroeconomic stability and promoting, to promoting economic growth. Um, finally, as was also touched on this morning, we're moving ahead with our own governance reforms. This is something that I'm personally closely uh, involved in. Um, the objective here is to ensure that the voice and representation in the fund better reflect the realities of today's global economy. We took an important step in the Singapore uh, annual meetings where the fund's governors agreed to uh, a two-year program of change that started with increasing in quotas for, for four clearly underrepresented countries. Those were China, Korea, Mexico and Turkey. The governors also agreed that the next stage should involve further increases in quotas for the fund's most dynamic members, while making sure that the voice and of low-income countries is protected. This second stage is to be completed no later than uh, September 2008, and we hope we can get it done sooner than that. Um, I think what's important here is that particularly dynamic emerging market uh, countries, uh, not least those in Asia, feel that they have adequate say in what happens uh, in, in the fund. They've got to feel that the IMF is their institution and not one that's uh, run by others and in which they have uh, inadequate voice. Let me just offer a few concluding thoughts about how we see the IMF's role in Asia. First of all, I would say that the reports of our demise are greatly exaggerated. 
Um, I think we do still uh, play and have a useful role to play uh, in the region. I think our relationship with, with uh, governments and officials in the region is probably, you'd be surprised, I think, by how close it actually is, uh, I would say. Um, obviously, we no longer have programs with emerging market countries. Uh, this is a this is a normal and I think highly desirable state of affairs and one that certainly we are much more comfortable with. I think it was the Asia crisis in its aftermath that were the, the aberration, not today. Um, we continue, as I said, to be closely engaged uh, with our members in Asia, both at the national level and, and with, with in regional fora. The engagement is very much based on a two-way dialogue in which we at the fund, I think, can bring global economic perspectives in, and the experience of the membership at large to national and regional economic issues, and in which the Asian perspective can be brought to bear on global, global economic questions. Um, we also continue to provide a good deal of technical assistance and training uh, to members in the region, particularly the, the, the lower income members. The, the, the primary objective of all this, of course, is to ensure financial stability in the region, but also at the global level where, where Asia uh, is an increasingly important player uh, uh, and, and it's on global issues that its voice needs to be uh, heard even more than it has been. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, could you just say, when could an Asian expect to be head of the International Monetary Fund? I, I can't answer that. Uh, I, 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 don't make, I don't make the decisions. Uh, we've certainly had Asians of, as, as head of the Asian department on more than, on more than one uh, occasion. I think I'm a bit of an aberration uh, in that respect. We've got a few extra minutes. Can I put this down? I have to disconnect it. Okay. Well, I have to start by thanking Bhumika. Um, I'm normally very selective about um, which students of mine I acknowledge as my students. But um, two years ago, I think it was, Bhumika was my student, I'm now pre pleased to say, in the Development Studies Institute at LSE. And I think she's done a terrific job in organizing this conference. Um, I did try and uh, ask some of my colleagues at LSE about how uh, we do a conference on the 10th anniversary of the Asian financial crisis, and the response I got was one of ennui, just boredom. That's past. We're moving on. So I think um, it's all the more commendable that uh, you set about organizing this. Secondly, I do want to thank, in more than a normal way, the Wilson Center, and I'll tell you why, because for me the Wilson Center has very positive vibes. The reason is that um, I was writing a book which came to be called Governing the Market when I was working inside the World Bank th through the second part of the 1980s. Um, the argument I was making was extremely uh, unwelcome in the World Bank and the Wilson Center offered me a visiting fellowship to come here for three months. It was not in this building, it was in the castle, um, where I wrote the critical chapters of that book, so uh, as a kind of refugee from a, an intellectually quite inhospitable place. So I'm always very grateful to the Wilson Center for that opportunity. Now today I'm going to talk about what the high command of international finance, that is the IMF, the World Bank, the BIS, the G7 governments, especially the US Treasury, um, what the high command of international finance has done and not done since the Asian crisis and the other financial crises of the 1990s in order to stabilize the international financial system and more than stabilize what they have done to mitigate the inherently pro-cyclical tendencies of financial markets. In the wake of the financial crisis, 
around about 1999, 2000, as you know, there was a uh, rush of proposals made for radical reforms in the international financial architecture to make what was called the NIFA, New International Financial Architecture. These included such things as a larger, much larger IMF, although George Schultz uh, wanted actually the abolition of the IMF, which would have also been a radical change, um, uh, a global financial regulator, a sovereign bankruptcy court, uh, International Deposit Insurance Corporation, even a global central bank. Um, and these had in common that if implemented, they would have uh, injected a very large increase in international or supranational authority into the functioning of financial markets. And of course, they got no further than the drawing board precisely because international financial markets did not want a substantial increase in, uh, in state-based uh, supranational authority in their operations. Thank you very much. Um, so they died. And there is now what Ken Rogoff described as in, in a Financial Times article in February as a smug belief, that's his phrase, not mine, that we basically have got the stability problem of the international <clears throat> financial uh, system solved. We don't need to do uh, more than has been done um, already. And I think that he's right to a point that there is a kind of smug belief, there's a sense of complacency uh, that has reasserted itself in the wake of the financial crisis, but also misleading because something, I think, um, has happened which is very significant but also less radical than the NIFA proposals were. And what I have in mind as having happened, which is very significant, um, is the formation, or at least the very intense development of what was there already, of what I call the SSC, SSC system. SSC stands for Standards, Surveillance and Compliance. By this, starting now with standards, standards of good or best practice in things, as David uh, Burton has referred to in things like transparency, data dissemination, um, secondly, bank supervision, thirdly, financial um, accountability, fourthly, corporate governance. In the wake of the crisis, a big effort has been made to develop standards of good practice across these areas, formulated by official bodies on the one hand, like the Financial Stability Forum established in 1999 by the IMF, by the World Bank, by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, and also by a whole gamut of unofficial bodies which became in, uh, intensely engaged in promoting global standards like the International Association of in Insurance Supervisors, the International Organization of Securities Commissioners, the International Federation of Stock Exchanges, so that's the first component, standards. That's the first S. The second S, surveillance. Surveillance of national economies, of their foreign exchange reserves, fiscal balances, national banking systems, corporate governance laws, and so on, carried out by the IMF, by the World Bank, and by other bodies like the rating agencies. And the C, compliance. Initially, compliance to these standards um, was expected to be uh, enforced by formal enforcement mechanisms operated by the IMF, such as structural conditionality, contingent credit lines, Article 4, consultations, and the like. But in fact, the formal enforcement mechanisms haven't really uh, developed. Instead, what we have seen is the informal force enforcement, the development of or the expectation that there would be informal market-based enforcement of standards of good practice 
as revealed by the surveillance exercises, um, via the electronic herd, that is the electronic money managers, to use Tom Friedman's phrase, which was then used by um, Paul Bluestein in his wonderful book, if you haven't uh, come across it, called The Chastening, which is an inside account of the unfolding of the Asian, Brazilian, Russian crises. Quite remarkable piece of reporting. Paul Bluestein, The Chastening. So um, there was, as I said, there's, there was expected to be informal enforcement by the electronic herd of money managers. Um, and the mechanism of informal enforcement went like this. The results of the surveillance exercises done by the IMF and the other bodies would be made public. And even if not made public, um, they could easily be leaked out from the network of people doing the surveillance, the network of regulators, um, to market participants who wish to know the results of the surveillance. So this knowledge would in one way or another become public. Secondly, the second proposition was that financial market participants would respond to the results of the surveillance by rewarding countries or banks or other firms which complied more with the standards of good practice, and so they would lend more to those who complied at cheaper rates, and conversely would punish those who complied less. And therefore, thirdly, governments, knowing this reward and punishment mechanism was working, would seek to comply more with these standards of uh, good practice. And therefore, finally, through this greater compliance of governments, financial regulators, banks, and others, the international financial system would become more stable. That was the argument. That is the theory of the SSC system. So the, just let me repeat the theory. If market participants get higher quality and more frequent and relevant information, that's what is meant by increased transparency, number one, and if those market participants change their risk management, risk assessment practices, so as to be more sensitive to present and future market volatility, then through this mechanism, global financial stability will be enhanced. And so in response to this, we have seen, as I said, this flurry of international standards being formed involving especially the Financial Stability Forum, the IMF, the Basel Committee, and so on. In the IMF, uh, uh, the IMF has become quite energetic in making ROSCs. ROSCs stands for Reports on the Observance of Codes, of Standards and Codes. Um, some 600 ROSCs have been done in the period since 1999 to the end of 2006, and 130 countries have had at least one ROSC, that is one report on the observance, on their observance of standards and codes. And the ROSCs fed into this larger exercise of the financial um, sector assessment program. Um, and more recently, the fund has initiated um, what is called the CCE. It's a completely o um, opaque acronym which stands for Coordinated Compilation Exercise in Financial Soundness Indicators, uh, which is a much more quantitative um, uh, measure of uh, compliance uh, of uh, country systems with standards. And uh, that's the IMF. In the Basel Committee under the BIS, um, we have new standards for capital adequacy and for banking supervision in the form of the Basel II um, standards. Well, the question is how significant is this move to the SSC system? Um, I imply in calling it a new system that it is significant, much more significant than would be inferred from Rogoff's um, uh, phrase that we current, in, there is currently a smug belief prevailing 
about the stability mechanisms of the international financial system. I think that this, uh, the development of this system is quite significant, even to put it more uh, uh, rather uh, dramatically, it, the development of the system can be taken as the end of the Washington consensus and the beginning of the post-Washington consensus consensus. And what I mean is this, that the Washington consensus up to, let us say, the late 90s was based on classical liberalism on the idea that the market and the state, the market and government, were somehow opposed and that the path of reform had to be to get the government out, to let markets work, get the prices right. Um, Ann Kruger sat in the World Bank in the 1980s receiving drafts of the World Development Reports and whenever a draft had in it a box um, showing that some government was doing well in uh, managing public sector enterprises, let us say, or in, uh, who knows, capital controls. She would put a red slash through the box, take it out, and she would write in the margins, we don't want to tell them how to do it well, we want to tell them how to do it less. That's classical liberalism, get the state out. The post-Washington consensus consensus, on the other hand, almost tips this on its head. It says that markets are not natural phenomena. They must be governed. Um, and in particular, international financial markets must be governed by a substantial increase in international authority setting standards, universal, comprehensive standards for all market participants. And these standards are to be formulated not mainly through the market, but mainly through a state-based political process, which is then injected into the operations of financial markets. As I said, this is a less radical injection of political authority into financial markets than was wanted by many proponents of the new international financial architecture. It's less than they wanted, but it's still very significant. That's the point I want to make. Um, now, what about the effects of this system? Well, this could be a long uh, lecture, um, the question of effects. Just let me mention uh, four, and I'm going to have to do it just in, by way of headlines. The first effect is that according to the IMF's own independent evaluation office, the information revealed by these surveillance exercises, by the ROSCs, by the financial sector assessment programs and so on, turns out to be on the whole, with some exceptions, not much used by financial markets, market participants. They don't look at this stuff on the whole. Um, although they do look more at things like the compliance of a um, banking system, national banking system, with the Basel codes, than they look at things like compliance with the IOSCO standards. But on the whole, what is striking from these studies of how much financial market participants use this information is how little they use it. The second point, in a way, runs slightly against what I just said, the second point is that to the extent that they use it, there is a good argument that has, made, has been made by uh, quite a number of people who know much more about the functioning of financial markets than I do. There is a good argument that the effect of this homogenization of data that is being made available about all economies, and remember this is a very big effort to survey all economies, not just economies near crisis, but all economies. The homogenization of data that is the result of this effort at surveillance in line with uh, comprehensive and universal standards, um, and not just homogenization, but also the increased intensification of data, as David mentioned, such as the release of information on foreign exchange holdings every day. That's what I mean by intensification. Um, 
And also, thirdly, the adoption of very similar models of risk assessment uh, by banking systems under the Basel II um, proposals. In other words, a homogenization of the uh, models for assessing risks. The impact of these three things together may be, may well be, to increase the pro-cyclicality or the herding behavior of market participants. They all have much the same information um, uh, uh, very rapidly to hand and they're using very similar models to assess that information. And um, paradoxically, the IMF's move from the more qualitative judgments made in the ROSCs and the financial sector assessment uh, program, the more qualitative judgments made there, to the more quantitative judgments made in this CCE thing, where the fund uses basically 12 core uh, measurements to measure the stability of a financial system, that shift from qualitative judgment to quantitative judgment may actually increase the pro-cyclicality or the herding behavior of market participants. This is an argument that Avinash pursued, um, who used to be head of research at JP Morgan and at State Bank, has made just for one. So um, to the ex my point is that to the extent that market participants do look at th this information, it may not have the stabilizing effects that David um, implied. It may have destabilizing effects because of the way that it homogenizes information. The third effect is that the Basel II uh, standards probably are going to, and they're being rolled out now, disadvantage banks in developing countries relative to banks in developed countries. Um, the Basel Committee's own most recent study of the impact of the adoption of Basel II standards suggests, so this is the Basel Committee's own calculation, suggests that banks using what is called the advanced internal ratings-based approach for assessing market risks, they will have reductions in their capital requirements in relation to Basel I of about 30%. Whereas, and of course those banks are, get, are based in developed countries on the whole. They're using the most sophisticated methods. They're, they're developed country banks. Whereas banks using the simpler, what is called foundational approach of Basel II, which are banks based mainly in developing countries, they will have an increase in their capital requirements of the order of 40%. So based, banks based mainly in developed countries will have a reduction in their capital requirements of about 30%. Banks based in developing countries will have an increase in their capital requirements of roughly 40%. That's what I mean by Basel II building in a structural disadvantage to developing country banks. And the fourth and final effect um, that I'll mention is much more controversial and gets much more deeply into political economy. My argument is that this SSC system as a whole has a sort of gravitational pull towards a, a pull of developing country political economies, national economies. It pulls them in the direction of one particular type of capitalism, which is the Anglo-American type. And I can illustrate this in terms of the Basel standards. Um, it's quite clear that the international financial system needs rules of prudence because confidence of the, is of the essence in a banking system, especially in an international banking system. So we agree that the international financial system has somehow to provide the public good of confidence, and that can be provided by rules of prudence. But the Basel Committee's standards imply that 
to meet rules of prudence, you have to meet rules of capital adequacy. That is, prudence is translated into levels of capital. And that is in line with the operating system of Anglo-American banks and the Anglo-American financial system more generally, where there are short-term relationships between banks, firms, and government, and where banks are expected to be profit-maximizing firms um, run for the interests of their shareholders. Now, in many other parts of the world, including Japan, including East, other East Asia, including developing countries with, for example, development banks, banks are, so, uh, are conceived as different kind of entities than entities which simply maximize profits for their shareholders. They are conceived as something more akin or at least to have some functions that are akin to public utilities. And they perform a mixture of private purposes and public purposes. And for, um, to a degree, they receive government guarantees. Um, and in particular, they are in a system of, uh, in a trading ethic where they don't, they're not expected to immediately pull the plug on a borrower who gets into difficulties because they expect to operate with long-term relationships rather than short-term relationships. And the government comes in as a sort of buffer of this system of long-term relationships between banks and firms. And my argument is, I can't really spell it out, that, that the, the spirit of the Basel standards is to delegitimize this kind of system, which I would argue was very important for the rapid growth, rapid diversification, rapid high levels of investment in East Asia, um, uh, uh, levels of investment that simply could not have been obtained in an Anglo-American type of banking system with short-term relationships with banks max or oriented to simply maximizing profits. But the develop so my point is that the development of these standards makes it much less likely that other developing countries coming up behind East Asia can adopt an East Asian type of banking system. The standards pull all countries towards an Anglo-American type of system. And for several kinds of reasons, I think that that is a bad thing. If I'm right, that namely that this SSC system disadvantages developing country banks relative to developed, and also that the whole thrust of the system is to pull countries around the world in the, in the direction of an Anglo-American type of financial system. And of course, financial systems are not isolates. The whole other institutional domains have to adjust in the same ar around that change in financial systems. If I'm right, then there's a political economy question. Why has this happened? Well, there's an obvious short answer to it because this whole exercise of formulating these standards and codes has been done by governments in, of the G7 and by developed country banks. Um, the Basel Committee has been intense, in intense discussions with private market participants, but especially with the IIF, the International Institute of Finance. The I International Institute of Finance speaks very largely for developed country banks. So the bottom line is that this whole process of formulating standards, mechanisms of surveillance and so on, has been done very large in a process which is very largely dominated by developed country states and by developing uh, and developed country financial organizations. And that's why it has come out as it has come out. It is a deeply illiberal process. Um, these organizations on the whole, and, and including the unofficial ones that I mentioned earlier, um, they have such democratic deficits that you could almost say they have democratic absences. Hayek would be shocked that the world is operating in this kind of way. So let me just uh, spend one or two minutes on uh, the question of what should be done. Um, we can talk more about this um, 
in the discussion. There have to be governance changes. I asked David um, uh, this flip question, when will an Asian be able to be managing director of the IMF? But right now it is absolutely scandalous that the Europeans are saying that provided Wolfowitz will resign, they will affirm the American right to appoint the president of the World Bank. This should be a golden opportunity to change this rule, which may have had legitimacy in 1945, but has absolutely no legitimacy now, that the heads of these very prominent world institutions um, uh, should be reserved one for an American, one for a U European. That, that has to change. And the more that the Indians, the Chinese, uh, the uh, East Asians build up regional arrangements, like a, a move towards an Asian regional monetary fund, then the more likely that there will be changes in these world organizations driven by desperation so as to keep the Asians in. So that's another good reason for building up regional initiatives. Um, but I want to finish on the point about capital controls because David articulated very clearly the IMF's uh, current line on capital controls. The line is basically that capital controls are to be avoided except in very exceptional circumstances. He didn't actually say, but I think many people in the fund would probably continue to wish that the fund's articles of, agreements, uh, of agreement could be changed so as to give the fund jurisdiction over the capital account um, the, the substance of the argument is that countries should rely on regulation, not on restrictions. Regulation, yes. Restrictions, no. And so um, countries have to build up their regulatory capacity, um, and when that capacity is strong enough, uh, then they should have unrestricted uh, movement of capital. There's just one problem with that. Um, which is that we actually don't know very much about how to judge the strength of a regulatory system. And I give you one illustration. Uh, the World Bank published a glossy volume called Private Capital Flows to Developing Countries in April 1999, uh, three months or so before the Asian crisis. And in this publication, it made the mistake of listing the countries whose financial regulatory systems were strong enough to allow more or less unrestricted movement. And they were Korea, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, Brazil, Chile. Um, and the point I'm making is that at least then, and there's a question mark, have we really improved so much since then, um, our knowledge of uh, how to judge the strength of a regulatory regime so that um, movements of capital in and out can be unrestricted is actually not very good. And since we know that all the weight of the G7 states and of private financial firms in the uh, G7 want to have unrestricted movement, we who are not speaking for those financial interests should be much more cautious about sanctioning a kind of uh, policy that says, well, countries should pretty well eliminate capital controls. Thank you. Could I just say one thing? Because I think my, my views on, and the fund's views on capital controls are slightly misrepresented. For a country that has capital controls, we would say be very cautious about phasing them out, do it slowly, and only as your banking and, and other systems are, are, are adequately strengthened. For those that have already removed them, I was merely saying be cautious about reimposing them because that imposes costs and you have to balance the potential costs against any benefits. Okay, thank you, and I, I want to thank uh, Bumika again for organizing this, and everyone else who, who worked on it, Dan uh, also from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. That's my organization. By the way, if you want more information on some of the things, at least, that I'm talking about today, you can find it at uh, CEPR.net. 
So, uh, as I said at the beginning, uh, there was a, this was a, the Asian crisis was a, a formative event at the end of the, uh, at least uh, towards the end of the, the last uh, century. And I can remember uh, there were hearings here, for example, um, when, when all this was going on. In fact, uh, the IMF had to come and get uh, money. Uh, it got $90 billion, uh, a 50% uh, increase in its quota, $18 billion of which was uh, appropriated by the U.S. Congress, and then the other countries matched. But it wasn't so easy. It failed on three votes in the House of Representatives. It never passed, actually, the House. It ended up uh, passing in conference because there was no way to uh, block it in the Senate. But uh, it was quite a fight, and in fact, one of the conditions attached to that uh, legislation was the formation of the, the Meltzer Commission, which uh, took a critical look at the international financial institutions. And that was all a result of this crisis and what was widely perceived as the mishandling of the crisis uh, by the IMF. And I'm, I'm going to argue that that was a major turning point in the history of the financial system because it was a major turning point in the history of the most powerful international financial institution at the time, which was, was the uh, IMF. Just one uh, story I remember from the hearings at, uh, at the subcommittee of the banking committee, I think it was, or maybe the full banking committee in the House, there was a, uh, there was a series of witnesses that came uh, forward to testify and uh, included uh, Treasury Department officials and some uh, financiers. And I remember one of the financiers was being questioned by a congressman from Alabama, a Republican who was kind of conservative, but a, a bit of a populist. And at the time, the, the line of the financial institutions was the problem in, 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 in uh, and this was the media played this up a lot, the problem in, in East Asia was uh, crony capitalism. And so the congressman said, well, I've heard a lot of talk today about crony capitalism and crony capitalists. Isn't that what you are? <laughs> anyway, the, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the uh, it kind of highlighted. Didn't, didn't you miss out the point? He was talking to George Soros. <laughs> was that who it was at the time? That was, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the, because uh, I, I, I wasn't, um, I, I can't remember exactly who it was, but. That's, yeah, that's quite possible. And uh, Soros, of course, was a major player, as you know, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in the financial uh, uh, sector at that time. And the, uh, th this, it kind of brought home the idea, uh, this, these kind of uh, these hearings and the whole uh, crisis itself uh, brought home uh, the idea of the role of the United States and the role of the, of the U.S. Treasury Department and the IMF in the in this crisis, and that it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just internal problems, as our previous panel uh, noticed. It was it was both internal and external, but the IMF and the Treasury Department, and uh, I don't want to be redundant because obviously the Treasury is the most important player in the IMF. They pushed for these restrictions uh, on capital flows to be removed in the 1990s. Uh, the things that Jomo described in the previous panels where uh, corporations and banks in the various countries could borrow directly uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the international financial markets without going through the central bank and without the uh, restrictions that were previously there. Now, when the crisis occurred, it was mainly brought on by a huge reversal of international uh, capital flows. It was about 11% of GDP that reversed uh, from 1996 to 97. And that's what brought on the crisis. And here, uh, obviously, there was a lot of short-term debt. There were the other weaknesses that were uh, described. But I think what was most needed at the time was, of course, a real lender of last resort. And that is what the fund is supposed to be. Uh, but the fund did not act in that manner. Instead, it uh, proceeded to argue that these were structural problems, and uh, they needed structural changes when it was really much more of a, a liquidity crisis. And in fact, Larry Summers was Deputy Secretary of the Treasury at the time, and he actually uh, personally intervened against uh, what was mentioned earlier, the formation of the 
the proposed formation of an Asian monetary fund in September of 1997 which had support from a number of countries and pledges of, of billions of dollars and could conceivably have prevented at least part of uh, some of the damage that was done. So the IMF uh, did not play uh, the role that people generally believe it, it plays in the international financial system. It finally did. I mean, eventually they did uh, provide the package after they established themselves as the final arbiter. Uh, they did put together a package that enabled the countries to roll over the loans, restructure the loans that was necessary, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, eventually did allow uh, normal growth to resume. But the damage was uh, caused by uh, these delays and the attempts to propose a whole uh, set of conditions. You know, in Indonesia, there were actually 140 conditions. The previous panel mentioned the famous picture. It was much more famous, I think, in Asia than here of... Um, of Michel Camdesu, the uh, managing director of the IMF, uh, standing over Siharto uh, when he was signing the agreement. There were 140 conditions, and they include the usual removal of res some restrictions on foreign investment, reducing tariffs, uh, closing some banks. But they even had such details as allowing cement producers to export with only a general exporter's license. Very detailed. And uh, I'm glad to hear David say that the IMF is moving away from this kind of uh, conditionality. But at the time, it was not only deeply resented, it was a total misdiagnosis of the, of the crisis. And so, too, was the macroeconomic policy. Korea, for example, the IMF uh, set a target of inflation for 1998, I think, of 5.2 percent. It was running then at 4.2 uh, percent. Given the, uh, that the currency had dropped by 80 percent, this was not a realistic uh, target. So uh, there were, uh, you know, counter-cyclical, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, pro-cyclical uh, policies instead of the counter-cyclical policies that were needed. And one of the uh, results of that was you had for the first time, and it wasn't the first time the IMF made mistakes or was protested. There were protesters in the streets in these countries. Uh, but that had been going on for quite a long time. This was... These were bigger economies. So I think South Korea at the time was the 10th largest economy in the world. And it attracted uh, criticism that had never been made before uh, from people uh, like Joe Stiglitz, who at the time was the ch chief economist of the World Bank, and uh, Jeffrey Sachs. And the two of them in particular, I mean, Jeffrey Sachs, you know, accused the fund of pouring gasoline on the fire and so on. And there was quite a lot of discussion about that. Uh, Previous panel, uh, Jomo, I think, mentioned Jagdish Bhagwati's description of the IMF Wall Street Treasury uh, Complex, I think he called it, at the time. And so this, uh, this uh, stimulated a whole debate about the, the, the role of the fund. Uh, just, I don't want to pound too hard on the fund. I'm not trying to give David here a heartburn. But uh, there were other mistakes as well, the uh, closure of the 16 Indonesian uh, uh, banks, uh, for example, which the fund thought at the time would help stabilize the banking system. It actually caused a run uh, on the banks. A number of these mistakes have been acknowledged, but I, think, I don't think the fund uh, really acknowledged just uh, the, the magnitude of its errors and, uh, and uh, at least to the extent that should be necessary. And, of course, then they went on uh, to make a lot of the same mistakes in Argentina in the, in the crisis uh, that unfolded between uh, uh, 2000 and, and the end of, uh, of 2001. And uh, so why is this so important? Well, because uh, the IMF, because it, it, you know, it's actually more concentrated power than the previous speakers have described. It isn't just that the U.S. Treasury Department has 17% of the votes. You basically have an arrangement where uh, the Treasury has the dominant influence by far more than its voting or veto power would indicate. Because the executive board doesn't really make that many decisions by vote. Very, you know, I can hardly think of any time in the past 63 years where Europe and Japan, who have more votes, actually outvoted uh, the United States within, uh, within the fund or the bank. Now, maybe the Wolfowitz case will, uh, <laughs> will change that. Probably not because I think uh, this government will give in. But uh, 
the uh, so you have and, and why is this? Well, this is how it was. You know, it's the same question as why does uh, why does uh, France have a permanent veto on the Security Council and uh, Germany and Japan don't, and neither does India. Well, India was a colony in 1944 uh, uh, or 46, and you know. In 1944, when the IMF and the bank were created, the United States was the, basically the only standing industrial power. So uh, this is the system that's still in place. And you think, well, why don't the other countries try to change this? Well, you know, uh, you'd have to ask them, but my guess is that they, you know, kind of some of the, most of these governments would rather have the U.S. kind of having a vastly disproportionate share of influence uh, then to open it up to the question of why don't uh, you know India and Brazil have uh, seats on the Security Council or um, why don't the developing countries generally have any significant voice within the IMF and the World Bank? So this is a huge uh, governance problem, and uh, but it, it's much more than that because what's happened now since the Asian crisis has been a a big change in the international financial architecture, not the kind that, uh, the kinds that were proposed back during the Asian crisis, and, but uh, a different kind, and that is uh, this influence has really uh, diminished enormously. And uh, I want to talk about how that happened because I think it's still going on, and it's, it's one of the most important developments taking place because it's not over. You know, we've had something like 100 financial crises in the last 30 years, and so there will be another one. There are huge imbalances in the world economy still, some of which were mentioned. And uh, the, uh, so, so when, those, uh, when the next crisis hits, there's going to be an attempt. Who knows, will Congress appropriate another $18 billion uh, for the next uh, bailout uh, package, uh, wherever it occurs? Uh, we don't know, but the IMF is going to put itself forward as the leader and the organization that should organize whatever uh, whatever happens. And so it's important to see what's happening and why it's happening. And uh, what the, the power that the fund had is, of course, not based on their own lending or their expertise. It's based on having a, a kind of a cartel over credit in a lot of countries. And uh, of course, in the crisis situation, they had an absolute, you know, an enormous power, as uh, the book that Robert uh, mentioned, uh, the chastening goes through in great detail. Uh, you know, they could really determine what the what the terms of this uh, whole 117 billion dollar package was going to be. But even in normal uh, situations, or more normal situations, in a lot of uh, middle income and, and low income countries, especially the fund was the is the arbiter or has been the arbiter and uh, in in the sense that uh, if you don 't uh, meet the fund the IMF conditions you don 't get the money from in most cases from the World Bank from the uh, regional institutions like the inter American Development Bank and uh, from uh, the g seven uh, countries so that's uh, that 's where the power was and still remains for the poor countries, uh, but has broken down enormously over the last decade. And I would argue that the Asian crisis was the first step in that process. It, uh, it was a tremendous blow to the legitimacy of this 1944 uh, relationship uh, to the world. It was a tremendous, uh, and that was the first thing, it was a tremendous blow to the IMF's purported uh, expertise, uh, and, uh, you know, which had been, again, questioned many times, uh, but it never uh, so at such high levels, uh, both within the economics profession, uh, in congressional hearings, and uh, in the United States, and uh, throughout the media in the world. It, as a matter of fact, the fund was pretty, fairly much, un, fairly un unknown, mostly uh, before that. And uh, third, it also encouraged the, the crisis, of course, encouraged the countries that could do so to pile up reserves as a form of uh, self-insurance so that uh, they would never have to go back to this kind of a, a negotiation process again. And that, uh, I think, was, a fir was the first major uh, change. Now, um, having said that, you know, it wasn't the, the end of the story. And, the, you know, the Chiang Mai initiative was, for, for example, was created in 2000, but it still had the condition that any borrowing over uh, 10% of the funds that were there 
had to uh, require an IMF agreement. I think this was later uh, up to 20%, uh, but still tied to the IMF. So the process, uh, you know, uh, kept going uh, forward. The, uh, the second, I think, major step in this uh, process uh, post-Asian crisis was the Argentine crisis. And here was a case where, again, uh, the fund uh, failed to play its role, uh, its uh, presumed role of the lender of last resort. The economy was uh, devastated uh, by the end of 2001 when the uh, uh, exchange rate uh, collapsed and Argentina engaged in the largest uh, sovereign debt default in uh, history. Uh, and uh, the fund uh, did not offer any aid. In fact, uh, throughout uh, 2002, there were uh, painful negotiations. And once again, as in the Asian crisis, the fund insisted on attaching a, a number of conditions which appeared to be irrelevant uh, to the recovery. In fact, uh, in retrospect, were probably inimical uh, to the recovery. And uh, the international financial institutions, mostly the IMF, drained a net $4 billion out of the country, about 4% of GDP, uh, during this time, uh, it, it was really the opposite of providing the aid that the country needed to recover from its worst, uh, you know, worst uh, depression probably in the last 50 or 100 years. And uh, this was, uh, uh, you know, and this led even to at one point the Argentine government uh, technically defaulted to the IMF in September of uh, 2003. And... Uh, at that time, there was a lot of discussion about, well, what could the, you know, should the, should the Argentine government uh, accept these conditions? Because they needed to roll over their loans. Uh, that's what they were looking for. They weren't even expecting at this point to get any real aid, but just to roll over the loans that they actually owed to the IMF because the IMF had uh, loaned enormously during the crisis in support of the, uh, the fixed exchange rate, which, of course, was the, one of the main... Uh, reasons uh, for the uh, disaster, that is the preservation of that exchange rate way beyond the point where it, could, it was uh, viable. And uh, nobody really knew what would happen because nobody had defaulted. Only countries had done so previously were basically failed uh, states like uh, Congo or um, Iraq. And uh, so uh, it turned out that the, uh, it, it didn't... Uh, it didn't. It didn't hurt Argentina. In fact, uh, Argentina began a recovery which uh, was quite robust, uh, ignoring uh, most of the advice, I would say, of the fund, not giving in on the debt uh, that is driving a hard bargain. That was one of the things the IMF was pressuring them for the most. Uh, they began a recovery which is still going quite strong. It's uh, averaged 8.6 annually now, uh, uh, growth uh, for five years. And uh, they, um, uh, there's, you know, all the forecasts and all the predictions in the in the press and the, uh, among most economists that it was going to collapse after three months, six months, one year, two years. It, you know, it just didn't occur. Everybody thought they had to do at least more of what the IMF wanted uh, in order to uh, recover. Uh, but in fact, they they did quite well. And I can. Uh, you know, uh, I, we have uh, papers on our, our website where you can look at some of the policies that that uh, led to this uh, success uh, in in more detail. But the point was, I think that the main uh, influence that this had, that Argentina had, was uh, to show that uh, first that the economy could recover, that a, a country in crisis could require recover without any IMF uh, package or any help uh, whatsoever, and uh, secondly. Uh, that the policies that the government chose uh, in, with a lot of uh, fighting with the IMF um, uh, turned out to be uh, quite successful. The third, uh, I think, phase, uh, and this was mainly in Latin America, because the Asian countries built up reserves. Russia also built up enormous uh, reserves. They started uh, growing uh, pretty fast after. Uh, they were, of course, another uh, huge disaster uh, of, I would say, IMF-sponsored uh, policy in the first uh, half of the 90, or the, you know, 91 on. And uh, they didn't really break out of that until the last vestige of their uh, IMF program, which was the fixed exchange rate, collapsed in 98, and they've been growing quite rapidly ever since. And they've also built up reserves 
and uh, gone outside this uh, this uh, system. So, uh, uh, but in Latin America, I think the big uh, change came, uh, the biggest change after Argentina, when Venezuela decided to make its reserves available uh, to other countries in the region uh, without uh, conditions, policy conditions or any conditions. Uh, and uh, of course, a number of countries have borrowed or have uh, received commitments, Argentina, borrowed two and a half billion when they decided to pay off uh, their loans to the IMF. And uh, the, uh, of course, uh, they've uh, made commitments uh, to Ecuador and Bolivia and uh, Nicaragua and other uh, governments as well. And so even Nicaragua, for example, you know, another example, a small poor country, or Bolivia, they, uh, Bolivia just stopped its uh, IMF agreement after uh, 20 years in uh, March and uh, of last year, and uh, previously this would have meant that they couldn't get other aid, uh, even from Europe. But that's no longer true. Uh, Nicaragua is a small, uh, poor country. Uh, they're uh, bargaining with the IMF right now. They have a lot more uh, bargaining power, uh, quite a bit, because again, they have another uh, source of, of credit. So these are huge uh, changes. They've really changed the entire politics of Latin America. I would say that Latin America is, uh, most of Latin America, which now has left, uh, or left of center uh, governments, um, is more independent of the United States uh, than, than Europe is, uh, uh, which is uh, quite remarkable for a region that you know, was always referred to as the United States backyard and, and so on. So uh, again, this is because the, uh, the IMF, and it's not just the IMF, it's Treasury, so I'll be fair to the fund because it's not, you know, the IMF is not really an independent actor here. It is the, primarily the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, this was the major avenue of influence uh, of the U.S. government in implementing a whole set of uh, economic policy reforms. Uh, they're usually known as neoliberalism in Latin America. And this uh, really has, uh, this this source of power has come to an end in the uh, middle income, in most of the vast majority of the middle income countries. In fact, the IMF's whole uh, portfolio, last I looked, was uh, about $20 billion, uh, down from $96 billion as recently as 2004. And uh, $10 billion of that is Turkey. And I believe Turkey is also planning on uh, paying off the fund as well. So. Again, my apologies if I sound like I'm picking on the fund, but this was a major arrangement uh, that uh, enabled uh, these, a lot of these reforms, the ones that led to the Asian uh, crisis and the ones that were implemented in the course of the crisis uh, to actually take place. And I don't think uh, it's going to happen like that uh, in the near future. But the question then remains, what about the future? I think uh, Jomo put forward a, a, a good uh, series of reforms, and I don't have to uh, repeat those. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the one I will, uh, I guess, focus on is the regional. I think the regional um, institutions are going to be the key because we've seen now 10 years all the events that I described and others have described, and where has been the reform? We have more unregulated capital than we did at the time of the Asian crisis with the uh, financial derivatives and hedge funds. And uh, despite uh, some you know, efforts here and there, uh, the reform at the very top is not, is, not, uh, is not coming right away. So the regional, I think, uh, arrangements offer the best uh, possible alternatives, I think, to the extent that the Chiang Mai initiative uh, can d divorce itself from the IMF. Or, and or uh, you get a really uh, an Asian monetary fund that can act as a, a lender of last resort. That could be a very uh, big step for that region. Uh, in Latin America, you now have a process with uh, six countries, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Paraguay are negotiating uh, right uh, next week, actually. The finance ministers will be meeting again, and then in June, they hope to have a, a new institution beginning called the Bank of the South. And they're also uh, planning a, some kind of a fund of the South, either using the existing uh, Latin America Reserve Fund or uh, possibly creating a, another one. But the point is to have, uh, again, a fund that would uh, stabilize and provide the uh, necessary liquidity in crises of this kind. 
and also a development bank that would uh, finance uh, regional integration. You know, the Inter-American Development Bank loans, I think, eight and a half billion a year, and uh, about one percent, maybe, of their resources have gone to uh, to uh, regional integration. So. These regional uh, initiatives and regional integration, I think, offer the best uh, hope for a, uh, a, a better and more stable and pro-growth, uh, pro-development uh, set of policies uh, that can be more successful and avoid at least uh, some of the crises uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you to all of our three very articulate speakers uh, at this panel. I would now like to open the floor up to questions. Uh, again, please wait for the microphones to come to you. Please identify yourself, and please be brief with your questions and comments as we're all probably wanting to get some lunch pretty soon. So. <laughs> Professor Giovannino? Uh, thank you very much. I, I just want to make a brief comment. And, uh, since um, Mr. Burton uh, mentioned about the Indonesian case, uh, this is uh, relations between high interest rate and tight monetary uh, policy. I guess uh, it is indeed very true when, uh, after the analysis that real interest rate maybe was almost like negative. But in terms of, of policy, we are talking about uh, always uh, nominal uh, rate of interest. And actually, is what you said was very true, that when in terms of real, in Indonesia, an interest rate was only uh, more positive in mid-98. But actually, even before the IMF came, uh, Bank Indonesia already uh, raised the interest rate double in uh, August of, of 97. And again in January, just after uh, we got a little bit of the independence, we, we did that again. But of course, again, when now after the effect, you said, hey, in terms of real uh, rate of interest, that was still very bad. It become, uh, in, uh, in terms of the monetary policy, it become uh, really uh, too loose, not because of the, the policy on the monetary side itself, but because of the bailing out uh, 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 of, of banks. Uh, and another one, uh, on your uh, uh, formal uh, kind of attitude about uh, capital control, I can sort of attesting that uh, in the letter of intent that Indonesia signed in October, actually that was very specific that in September of 97, Bank of Indonesia made a policy of trying to sort of control of the rupiah offshore as well as limiting the transactions for the foreigners. And it was very specific that we have to get out of that. Uh, uh, that was very, very clear. It was your pre predecessor, actually. You know, actually, the, uh, uh, the late, uh, he already uh, passed away, who the of delegations uh, at the time. I think that was the only state. And uh, another one on the uh, politics of, uh, uh, you know, the regional uh, cooperations and integrations. Of course, aside from it's getting more and more in, uh, even though it's almost like still embryonic, the, all the discussion was coming from way even before the, uh, uh, the, 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 the crisis. And that hopefully uh, will have a pressure on the, uh, reform of the uh, IMF itself. Even in repaying the IMF uh, debt, politically, in, when you ask the, uh, the parliamentarian, etc., what they are uh, trying to do was sort of just let us repay <laughs> our debt so that we can be freed <laughs> out of IMF. That's the way they, they think is in, in politics. Thank you. Well, maybe briefly just a, a, a quick response. I mean, it's certainly true that interest rates were hiked in 
were raised significantly in, in, in August and I think September of 97, although they were subsequently eased, I think, as we went into the November period. They may have been tightened again in January. I agree at that point the hemorrhaging in the banks made it very difficult to control monetary policy. And One of the preconditions, actually, for, for, for getting a grip on monetary policy was dealing with the banking system, which was uh, done, I think, Effect, with effective closure of, of further banks uh, in, in April. Um, uh, and then that set the scene for drawing the line on liquidity and letting interest rates ride up as was necessary to stop the, the further creation of credit and allow SBIs to be issued as needed to do that. And, and interest rates went, went up pretty high at that point. I forget what it was now, 70 or 80 percent for a while. But that really stabilized the exchange rate, inflation came tumbling down at that point, and, and that was basically the end of the, uh, the worst part of the crisis, with, with dealing with the banking system, tightening monetary policy at that point to get credit growth under control, and, and getting the foreign creditors more involved. Those are the three things, I think, that, 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 that turned the corner uh, for Indonesia, but that was late in the game, and obviously enormous amount of uh, damage had been done by that point. Okay, we'll take other questions. Professor Chaudhary. Thank you. Uh, Basanta Chaudhary from Elizabethton College and uh, Rutgers University. Um, I would draw the attention of the panelists, uh, particularly the Barton, probably relevant. Uh, uh, the discussion between flexible versus fixed exchange rate. As you know, the world, since 1971 or early 70s, moved towards market-friendly, flexible exchange rate regime in general even though there are pockets of capital control here and there. Now the question is, if the East Asian crisis, one of the factors that you have noted, that fixed exchange rate or pegged exchange rate is one of the reasons or factors causing um, financial crisis, among other factors, um, could you shed some light about Hong Kong in that region, not affected at all by the financial crisis, or maybe not much, uh, as not discussed at all, uh, or Taiwan to a least uh, extent, now, Hong Kong exchange rate is different or pegged in many sense. Why, how Hong, Hong Kong was insulated from the crisis, maybe that will give us some idea about the debate between fixed versus flexible exchange rate and capital control. Thank you. Let me, let me say a couple of words about Hong Kong because, I mean, Hong Kong is the is the classic case where a pegged exchange rate is appropriate. It's a, it's a small, extremely open, highly flexible uh, e economy with a very sound, very well regulated uh, banking system. So it's the classic case where uh, a, a fixed exchange rate system is, is appropriate. Um, uh, and the currency board works there. It's worked for a long time. We 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 support its operation. But even Hong Kong wasn't unscathed by the by the crisis. It went through some tough times too. It had a, a property bust that took many years to to recover, and and growth slowed. So uh, even a, an extremely efficient, well-run uh, economy like Hong Kong didn't come out of it unscathed either. No, the only, only thing I was going to add is that, you know, we probably not on. It is? Okay. Um, you know, the, most of the pegged exchange rates you see today are, are mostly pegged uh, downward, like the Chinese uh, uh, exchange rate, for example. Uh, so there, you don't have the same risk that you, uh, uh, you have, you had during the, you know, that, that led to the Asian crisis today. I think that's one reason why you haven't among the others that were discussed, uh, some of which are not going to last, you know, the whole uh, very low, extremely low interest rates, which is mainly a result of U.S. Fed policy. Um, but uh, that's one reason why you haven't seen uh, any repeats of this kind of crisis. Eileen? Thanks. Very, very interesting panel. But uh, two, two comments or, or questions. Uh, one for Robert Wade in terms of your SSC theory, which I find fascinating and compelling. I'm wondering what, what the implication is 
of, of your theory? Is it that the IMF is losing its power as an institution, notwithstanding David's interesting riff on, on, Mark, on Mark Twain? Um, because I'm thinking about some of the literature and political economy and even some of your colleagues in the UK, like Tim Sinclair, that have been focusing on the increasing exercise of private authority, non-state actors, non-multilateral institutions um, in the global financial architecture. And so does things like the way that the Basel II Accord empowers credit rating agencies suggest that these kinds of private actors are exercising an authority that in fact is more significant than that exercised by the IMF. Um, and, and coming for David, um, I, one thing I thought that was very interesting about your presentation when you presented the slide about the rise of flexible exchange rate regimes um, in Asia, I was really heartened by that because I was just in preparing for this conference looking at Noral Rabini's blog and he's got a very interesting paper on the lessons of the Asian crisis um, on his website, though I was too cheap to download the full version. I just read the summary version, at least in the summary version, he suggests that one reason why Asian countries are heading toward another crisis is that they've adopted regimes of pegged exchange rates. And I was shocked by that kind of conclusion. And so in looking at your slide, um, I was, of course, uh, quite happy that I hadn't missed a major development. Well, I think that within the SSC system, yes, the IMF um, has certainly lost power. Um, one main reason is because, as is clear from what has been said, um, the borrowers are walking away and uh, it exposes a huge um, disincentive or mal-incentive in the IMF's basic funding structure, which is that the IMF gets its revenue from crises. Um, and if there are no crises uh, for it to lend into, uh, its revenue falls off. And the 2,500 or whatever it is staff of the IMF are suddenly left wondering um, what their role is. So this fact that not just uh, the borrowers are wa walking away not just from the fund but also from the bank is very fundamentally serious for the role of these multilateral institutions and since I believe that it is really important to maintain not necessarily these multilateral institutions but multilateral institutions which carry out some of the same functions and not just think that a proliferation of regional bodies will somehow be sufficient. I am worried about this uh, development. On the other hand, I'm not happy with the prospect of the IMF and the World Bank as presently governed being strengthened. So I'm quite happy to see them weakened as they are presently governed, but I want to see something put in their place or them transformed from the inside and outside to make them more truly democratic world bodies. Any questions on the floor? Okay, if we don't have any more questions, um, I think we can Leave to lunch. Lunch is going to be served uh, across the auditorium in the 